welcome to our 10th annual summit. Unbelievable. Time flies by, especially as we near the second coming of Christ. It seems like the clock speeds up. We know that's not true, but uh, you know the work will be finished quickly. And I believe that uh, we are seeing tremendous movements in the world to reach people groups that have never been reached before. And you'll be hearing some things about this uh, a little bit later on. Well, uh, we are going to study in my seminars Revelation chapter 18. It's a chapter that is not uh, one of the more popular chapters to study. Um, we usually study the first six verses, you know, where it speaks about the fall of Babylon and come out of her my people. But um, the rest of the chapter, verses 7 through verse 24, uh, not much is said about those verses. And um, basically, it describes the collapse of the Babylonian financial system. And you've seen the, uh, what's been happening with the stock market. Yeah. It's very turbulent, up and down, up and down, very similar to what happened in the year 2008. Uh, so we're going to be talking about that uh, in the context of Revelation chapter 18. But before we study that chapter, we absolutely need to look at where it fits within the book of Revelation. So we are going to study uh, in the handouts that you receive, the little syllabus, we are going to begin at page one where the title is The Three Angels' Messages in Summary. This will give us a reference point for when Revelation 18 is going to be fulfilled. But before we do, we want to have a word of prayer to ask for the Lord's blessing as we study together. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of being here at the summit. Thank you, Lord, for bringing everyone safely here. We ask that those who are still on the way, we know that there are several of them, that you will give them traveling mercies and bring them safely to the summit. Give us a wonderful spiritual blessing in the course of this weekend. We crave the need for your Holy Spirit. We ask that you will pour out that spirit abundantly without measure. And bless us as we open your word, we pray in the precious name of Jesus, amen. amen. Well, we're going to skip the first paragraph, and I'm going to go to the four bullet points that you find there on page one. What we want to do is take a look at the timing of the three angels' messages. We want to look at their meaning, their sequence, primarily their sequence, and their importance. And uh, at the bottom of the page, you have a summary of the things that we need to take into account in order to understand where the three angels' messages are located within the book of Revelation and the relationship that, these, uh, that Revelation chapter 18 has with the three angels' messages. So let's look at the bottom of page 1 at the sequence of events that we're going to take a look at. First of all, we are going to briefly review the prophetic chain of Daniel 7. Then we are going to examine the parallel but expanded prophecy of Revelation 13 verses 1 through 10. Then we're going to consider the prophecy of the land beast. Revelation 13 and verses 11 through 18. After that, we are going to look at the very next passage in Revelation. That's Revelation 14, verses 1 through 5, where you have a victory scene. The 144,000 are victorious over the beast, his image, and his mark and the number of his name. Then we are going to consider the harvest scene that follows the third angel's message. You know, the Son of Man sits on a cloud, he has a sickle in his hand, and he's coming to the earth, earth to harvest, the harvest of the earth and the grapes of the earth. And then we will take a look at the victorious song once again that is sung by the 144,000, which is found in Revelation chapter 15 and verses 2 through 4. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to begin at Revelation 13 verse 1, 
and we are going to move all the way through Revelation chapter 15 and verse 4. Now we're going to do it in summary form. We're not going to be able to study every detail within those chapters. It would take us far beyond the time that we have. But uh, these are the different aspects that we're going to take a look at. So let's go to page 2 in our syllabus and do a review of Daniel chapter 7. You know, I, the, the Lord gave me a very structured mind. Things have to make sense. Point A needs to lead to point B to point C, and then there has to be a logical conclusion. Uh, you know, I've had people tell me that if I hadn't become a minister, I should have been a lawyer. And uh, praise the Lord that I didn't become a, a liar. I mean a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> so let's review Daniel chapter 7. By the way, that was an intentional slip, intentional slip of tongue. Uh, we're just going to very briefly and very quickly review this. In Daniel 7, we have a lion. The date is 605 to 539 B.C. Then we have a bear, 539 to 331 B.C. A leopard, 331 B.C. to 168 B.C. A dragon beast, from 168 B.C. to 476 A.D. Then, this dragon beast sprouts ten horns, and the ten horns are complete in the year 476 A.D. Then a little horn starts rising among the ten and uproots three of the ten horns. The dates you have there in parentheses, 493, 534, and 538 A.D. The Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. And then the little horn, after it uproots three, it rises to absolute power and rules from 538 to 1798 A.D. And then, after the little horn rules till the year 1798 A.D., you have a judgment scene where the Ancient of Days sits, and then the Son of Man comes on the clouds to where the Ancient of Days is seated for the judgment. And then, the final point in Daniel chapter 7 is the moment when Jesus receives the kingdom from his Father. That's the sequence of Daniel chapter 7. Now, Revelation 13, 1 through 10 parallels Daniel 7. Uh, you say, how do we know that Revelation 13 verses 1 through 10 parallels and repeats Daniel 7? Well, it's very simple. Let's look at the bottom of the page, bottom of page 2, where we find the same beasts that we have in Daniel 7. It says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now here comes the connection with Daniel 7. Now the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Was there a leopard in Daniel 7? Yes. His feet were like the feet of a bear. Was there a bear in Daniel 7? Yes. And his mouth was like the mouth of a lion, also in Daniel 7. And the dragon, was there a dragon beast? With ten horns? Absolutely. It says, and the dragon gave the beast his power, his throne, and great authority. Now, you say, how do we know that Revelation 13, 1 through 10 is actually a repetition and an expansion of Daniel chapter 7? Well, there are three reasons in the middle of page 2. First, they are both in the same location of the prophetic chain. Daniel 7, you have lion, bear, leopard, dragon, ten horns, little horn. In Revelation chapter 13, you have lion, bear, leopard, dragon, ten horns, beast. So in other words, the little horn and the beast are in the same place of the prophetic chain. That's the first reason why the little horn of Daniel 7 is parallel to the beast of Revelation 13. The second reason is that the little horn and the beast perform the same actions. Did the little horn speak blasphemies against God? Yes. Does the beast speak blasphemies against God? Yes. Did the beast persecute the saints of the Most High? Yes. Did the little horn persecute the, the saints of the Most High? Yes. So the beast and the little horn perform the same actions. They also, the third reason is that they rule for the same time period. The little horn rules for time, times, and the dividing of time, and the beast rules for 42 months. 
a different way of expressing the same period. So we know that Revelation 13, 1 through 10 is a repetition of what we find in Daniel 7 with additional information. Now, at the top of page 3, you can see the sequence. Reve Daniel 7, lion. Revelation 13, 1 through 10, lion. Daniel 7, bear. Revelation 13, bear. Daniel 7, leopard. Revelation 13, leopard. Daniel 7, dragon. Revelation 13, dragon. Daniel 7, 10 horns. Revelation 13, the dragon has 10 horns. Then in Daniel 7, you have the little horn. And in Revelation 13, you have the sea beast. In Daniel chapter 7, the little horn rules 42 months, or rather, time times in the dividing of time. I need to reverse those. And in Revelation 13, the beast rules for 42 months. So are you dealing with the same power? Yes. Now, what are the nations represented here? Well, the lion represents which kingdom? Babylon. The bear represents Medo-Persia. The leopard represents Greece. The dragon beast is a symbol of the Roman Empire. The ten horns are the divisions of the Roman Empire. And the little horn represents what? The little horn represents the papacy. And the papacy rules 42 months or time, times, and the dividing of time, or Revelation 12 speaks of it also as 1260 days, and days are equal to years. Are you with me so far? Amen. This is just review. We've studied this many times before, but we need this as an anchor or a foundation for locating the three angels' messages as well as Revelation chapter 18. Now, Revelation 13, however, expands upon Daniel 7. In other words, Revelation 13 does not simply repeat Daniel 7. Revelation 13 does repeat some details, but it expands upon the material in Daniel 7. Now, what, in what way does uh, Revelation 13 expand upon Daniel 7? You have this in the middle of page 3. First of all, is there any mention in Daniel 7 about the little horn receiving a deadly wound? No. Is there in Revelation 13 a detail about the wounding of the beast with the sword? Yes. Is that an expansion in Revelation 13 upon what we find in Daniel 7? Absolutely. Secondly, does Daniel chapter 7 tell us that the little horn was wounded and then its wound was going to be healed? No. Daniel 7 simply says that the little horn was going to rule for 1,260 years. It takes us to 1798. Revelation 13 tells us that at the end of uh, its dominion, in 1798, the little horn or the papacy, the beast, was going to receive a deadly wound. And Revelation 13 tells us that the deadly wound was going to be what? Was going to be healed. So does Revelation 13 expand upon Daniel 7? Absolutely. It gives additional details. Revelation is an amplification or an expansion of Daniel 7. Now also, does Revelation 13 tell us who is going to heal the deadly wound and how the deadly wound is going to be healed? Absolutely. Yeah. Revelation 13, 11 to 18 tells us what power is going to give the sword back to the papacy and how the wound is going to be healed. Now let's go to the bottom of page 3 and let's follow uh, what I've written here. This passage describes a beast that rises from where? From the earth. It has two horns like a lamb, but it ends up speaking like a what? Like a dragon. Now, what nation is represented by this beast that rises from the earth? We don't have time to go into all of the details. It represents what? The United States of America, with its two foundational principles represented by the two horns. The two horns represent republicanism and Protestantism. It has nothing to do with the Republican Party. It has to do with a Republican style of government. It's a republic, in other words. Republicanism and Protestantism. Basically, the, the foundational idea of this is a separation of church and state. 
where the state functions as a state and the church functions as the church. They don't intermingle like happened with the papacy and the nations of Europe during the 1260 years. So basically, this beast that rises from the earth represents the United States. The two horns represent church and state separated, republicanism and Protestantism, religious and civil liberty. You can call it in different ways, but basically it means the same thing. Now let's go to the following paragraph in page 3. Notably, this beast, though claiming to advocate for civil and religious liberty, will end up repudiating those principles and will speak like a what? Dragon. Like a dragon. It has two horns like a lamb, but it speaks as a dragon. It can also be translated, and it spoke like a dragon. This beast will do what? Will heal the wound of the first beast by giving it back the sword of civil power that it lost in the year 1798. And now notice, everything this beast does, this beast from the earth, everything the beast of the earth does, it does to please the first beast and restore it to power. It seems like the, the, the main purpose of this beast from the earth is to give back the sword and the power that the first beast lost in the year 1798. You say, how do we know that? Well, take a look at the bullet points that we have on page 4 at the top of the page. And you can read these verses. This beast from the earth exercises all of the authority of whom? Of the first beast. It will do everything in the presence of the first beast. I like the way that the contemporary English version translates it. It says, it worked for the first beast. And the NIV translates uh, it worked on behalf of the first beast. So once again, it's doing everything to please the first beast. It exercises all the authority of the first beast. It will do everything in the presence of the first beast. It tells the whole world to what? To worship the first beast. It makes an image of the first beast. And it makes an image in honor of or to the first beast. It also enforces the mark of the first beast. Somehow I think that this, um, that this nation represented by the beast from the earth, its existence is to restore power to the previous beast. Everything it does, this beast from the earth, it does to restore power to the beast or the little horn that ruled for 42 months or for time times and the dividing of time. So far so good? Amen. Now, the key words in Revelation 13, 11 to 18 were at the middle of page 4. The key words in Revelation 13, verses 11 to 18 are the beast, the image, and the mark. Re remember those three words because we're going to find them in other successive passages in the book of Revelation. So Revelation 13 tells us that this beast from the earth uh, commands everyone to worship the beast. It makes an image of the beast and it enforces the mark of the beast. So the three key words that we need to keep in mind is beast, image, and mark. And you'll notice the three references here Revelation 14, 9 through 11, which is the third angel's message, will mention the beast, his image, and his mark. We know that it is actually harking back to the previous chapter. And then Revelation 15, verses 2 through 4, once again, it speaks about a victorious group that did not worship the beast, his image, or receive his mark. And then when you go to Revelation chapter 19, verses 19 and 20, it speaks about Jesus coming on a white horse with the armies of heaven. And it says there that standing against Jesus are the kings of the earth, the beast from the sea, and the false prophet, which is another way of saying the beast that rose from the earth. So we know that the last half of Revelation uh, deals with the beast, his image, and his mark in Revelation chapter 13. Revelation 14, 9 through 11, 
Revelation 15 verses 2 through 4 and Revelation chapter 19 verses 19 and 20. So are we supposed to link all of these verses? Absolutely, because they're dealing with the same theme. So when Revelation chapter 13 ends, it speaks about this beast that rises from the earth, uh, civil and religious liberty, the United States. Um, you know, it um, does everything to restore the power to the first beast. Revelation 13 ends, and we end with a question. Well, did everybody worship the beast and, re and the image and receive the mark? Wasn't there anybody that resisted the power of the beast and the image of the mark? Revelation 13 ends, and it doesn't tell us if there was really a group that was faithful to God. Where would you expect to find the faithful group? How about the very next chapter? How about the very next verse? In actual fact, Revelation 14, 1 through 5 belongs with chapter 13. It is the climax of chapter 13. Because after saying that the whole world wandered after the beast, most of the world received the mark of the beast, they worshiped the image of the beast, Revelation 14, verses 1 through 5 says, but not everyone. Because there was a group that had the seal of God on their foreheads. And they're standing victorious on Mount Zion. Are you with me? So Revelation 14, 1 through 5 is the climax of Revelation 13. Revelation 13 mentions those who worship the image, the beast, and receive the mark. Revelation 14 says, but wait a minute. There was a group that did not worship the beast, his image, or receive the mark. Those are the 144,000 that stand victorious on Mount Zion. Let's read that passage, Revelation 14, verses 1 through 5. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. Uh, did people receive the mark of the beast on the forehead? In, at the end of the previous chapter, read it, verses 16 and 17. The wicked received the mark of the beast. Now, in contrast, there's a faithful group that received what? The name of the father on the forehead. He continues saying in verse 2, And I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang as it were a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, that is with the apostate churches, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Are you following me or not? So Revelation 14, 1 through 5 is the climax of Revelation chapter 13. Now, let's notice in the next section here on page 5, Revelation 13, 1 through Revelation 14 and verse 5 has led us full cycle from the kingdom of Babylon to the moment when God's faithful remnant stands victorious on the heavenly Mount Zion. Let's go through it. Lion, that's in Revelation 13. Bear, Medo-Persia. Leopard, Greece. Dragon with ten horns. The Roman Empire. Actually, the dragon then gives its power, its throne, and great authority to whom? The Roman Empire gave its seat and its power to whom? To the papacy. Notice this statement from Ellen White. In the 6th century, the papacy had become firmly established. Its seat of power was fixed in the imperial city, and the bishop of Rome was declared to be the head over the entire church. Paganism had given place to the papacy. The dragon had given to the beast his power and his seat and great authority, and now began the 1260 years of papal oppression foretold in the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. So notice, Revelation 13 begins with lion, bear, leopard, dragon beast, ten horns, and then the papacy. But then Revelation 13 continues, if you continue here, the sea beast rules for how long? 42 months. And then what happens at the end of the 42 months? The sword gives the sea beast a deadly wound. And then what happens? The land beast does what? 
The land beast does everything to heal the wound of the first beast by making an image of the first beast and enforcing its mark. And then you have the crisis of Revelation 13. People can't buy or sell. A death decree is given against God's people. But then in Revelation chapter 14, 1 through 5, you find that there was a group that was victorious over the beast, his image, and his mark. Are you catching the structure? See, you know, sometimes we just simply take, we'll take a passage, you know, and, and we'll explain what the passage means. But there's a context to every passage. There's a context to every verse that helps us understand the, the flow, the entire flow. Now, let's talk about where the three angels' messages fit within this. This is the bottom of page 5. Now, uh, Revelation uh, chapter, uh, Revelation is not written in strict chronological order. It's written in repetitive cycles. And if you know where the cycle begins and ends, you'll be able to interpret the book a lot easier. Let's go to the bottom of page 5. After describing the 144,000 standing on Mount Zion victorious over the beast, his image and his mark. In other words, they're in heaven. They already gained the victory. We find next in Revelation 14 the three angels' message. Now it is obvious that the proclamation of the three angels' message does not occur after the 144,000 stand victorious on Mount Zion. Are you with me? Are the three angels' messages proclaimed after the 144,000 stand victorious in heaven? No. Yet in the biblical text in Revelation, the three angels' messages come after the 144,000 stand victorious. So how do we understand this? Revelation 14, we're at the top of page 6, Revelation 14, 6 through 12, takes us back in time to the beginning of the proclamation of the three angels' messages leading up to 1844 and ending with the close of probation. In other words, the three angels' messages take us back to the event or the message that actually gathered God's people on one side and the messages hardened those who end up worshiping the beast, his image, and receiving the mark. That is to say the three angels' messages take us back in time to explain how the 144,000 gained the victory over the beast, his image, and his mark. How did they gain the victory? They accepted what? They accepted and proclaimed the three messages. We know this to be true because the third angel's, listen carefully now, the third angel's message warns against worshiping the beast, his image, and receiving his mark, which in Revelation 13, 11 to 18, we had previously seen. So Revelation 13, 11, 18 speaks about the crisis over the beast, his image, and his mark. The third angel's message says, when that time comes, don't worship the beast or his image or receive the mark. Revelation 14 has the warning so that you're not on the wrong side that is described in Revelation 13. Are you with me or not? Amen. Now, let's read the three angels' message here. I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth the sea and springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she had made, has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone, here's, here's the reference to chapter 13, see, it's a warning not to be on the wrong side when the crisis of Revelation 13 comes. It says there, Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. And here is repeated once again, Revelation 13, 11 to 18. They receive no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. And then comes the remnant. Here is the patience of the saints. 
Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So basically, the reason why the 144,000 stand victorious on Mount Zion is because they accepted the three angels' messages. And those who worship the beast, his image, and receive the mark, they're on the other side because they rejected the three angels' messages. Yeah. Are you following me? Amen. Now, let's notice the characteristics of the three angels' message. First of all, the messages are sequential. They must be proclaimed in order. Why? Because it says, another, I saw another angel flying. Then it says, another followed him and another followed them. So they have to be proclaimed in order. Don't talk to people about the Sabbath before you tell them about the everlasting gospel. Amen. Amen. Don't tell them to come out of Babylon before you preach about the Sabbath and about what it means to fear God and give glory to God because they say, why should I get out? Amen. Well, because, because the first angel's message is not practiced where you're at. So come out. Now, second, the messages go to where? To every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So must God have a worldwide church to proclaim them? That's the reason for the existence of the Adventist church, folks. The only reason why we exist is to proclaim the three angels' messages. If we're not doing that, we pack up our bags and go home. It's that simple. Following point. The messages are God's final appeal before the close of probation. Because once the three angels' messages are proclaimed, the harvest of the earth is ripe and the grapes are ripe. ripe. So is the whole world divided into two groups by the three angels' message? Absolutely. They polarize the world. The top of page 7. Their proclamation is accompanied by what? By the power of the latter rain. You say, Why? Well, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand why. <laughs> because if the, if the harvest of the earth is ripe and the grapes of the earth are ripe, what is it that ripened the harvest in Bible times? The latter rain. So they're accompanied by the latter rain. The next point is their acceptance or rejection is a matter of what? Life or death. The first angel's message contains three imperatives, three commands. Fear God. Give glory to God and worship the Creator. Now, the second angel's message proclaims the fall of Babylon because Babylon rejects the first message. And then the third angel's message tells people, if you don't get out, this is what's going to happen to you. <laughs> is there a sequence? Yes. The first angel's message is the message concerning keeping God's commandments, reflecting God's character, giving Him glory. It has to do with worshiping the Creator by keeping His Holy Sabbath. And when you proclaim those things, people say, well, that's not done in my church. And then you're ready to say, well, get out. <laughs> and if people say, well, I don't know if I want to get out. Well, if you don't get out, this is what's going to happen. The third angel's message. So they are sequential. They build upon one another. Now let's go to page 7. Towards the middle of the page. The elements of the three angels message. The first angels preaches the everlasting gospel. What is it that, contain, that the everlasting gospel contains? Number one, Jesus was sacrificed what? Once and for all. He, needs to, he does not need to be sacrificed ever again. Number two, Jesus is our only and sufficient high priest. He intercedes for us. And three, we are saved by His righteousness alone and not by works. Amen. Does the papacy contradict all three of those? Yeah. They say that Jesus is sacrificed in every mass. <coughs> they say that uh, you need human priests to intercede between you and God. And they say that your works can gain merit before God. So the first angel's message preaches the everlasting gospel. tells people, hey, if you've got a false gospel, you're in the wrong place. But the first angel's message also proclaims the distinctive doctrines of the Adventist church that distinguish us from other churches. You have it in the middle of the page. Fear God. That expression is used time and again as I show in the series on the three angels' messages that we produced many years ago. It's coupled with the idea of keeping God's commandments. 
Uh, an example is Ecclesiastes 12. The last verse says, Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And by the way, uh, you know that it has to do with obedience because it's used, for example, when Abraham uh, was willing to sacrifice his own son, Isaac. Afterwards, God says, don't, don't kill the young man. Now I know that you fear me. And then, uh, you know, when Abraham went uh, to the city of Gerar and he met Abimelech and Abimelech took Abraham's wife, he didn't tell, her that, uh, tell him that uh, she was also uh, his wife, told, uh, told him that he, she was her sis his sister. Yep. And so uh, the, the king uh, Abimelech says to Abraham, why didn't you tell me she was your wife? And Abraham says, well, because there's no fear of God in this place and somebody might kill me. You see, where there's no fear of God, people kill. And so fear God in the Bible is linked with keeping God's commandments. Repeatedly in the Old Testament. Is that a distinctive teaching of the Adventist church? Yeah, because the rest of the churches say that the law was nailed to the cross. Jesus kept that we don't have to keep it. It's impossible to overcome before Jesus comes. You know, you have all of these excuses. But the first angel's message says, fear God, which means a deep respect an obedient respect to God. Then it says give glory to God. We give glory to God. I preached about this in our last summit by revealing his character. The glory that we give God is the glory that comes from God in the first place. By beholding him we're changed into his image and we reflect his glory. And then it tells first angel's message tells us that we're supposed to honor the creator. The Sabbath. What does the religious world say about the Sabbath? They say, well, the Sabbath was nailed to the cross. You know, we don't have to keep the Sabbath. The Sabbath was for the Jews. Is that a distinctive teaching of the Adventist church? It most certainly is. The first angel's message preaches distinctive messages of the Seventh-day Adventist church. By the way, the first angel's message also teaches that the dead are dead until Jesus comes. You say, how's that? Well, because the first angel's message says the hour of the God's judgment has come. So if the judgment begins at a certain date, it means that people did not go to hell or to heaven when they died. So if you believe that the judgment began in 1844, before 1844 no one went to heaven or to hell because God was not going to send them to heaven or to hell before they were judged. So implicitly you have the idea that the dead are dead until their name comes up in the judgment. And then when Jesus comes, he will reward them with everlasting life. Not at the moment of death. So are you catching the picture here? What does the religious world say about the dead? They say the dead know everything. What do they say about the Sabbath? It was for the Jews. What do they say about keeping the commandments? They were nailed to the cross. What do they say about the judgment? Well, it's when a person dies. So the first angel's message not only has the everlasting gospel, it has the distinctive teachings of the Adventist church as compared with what is taught by the religious world. Now, the three angels' messages then are God's last message to the world. They divide the world into how many groups? Into two groups. Those who worship the Creator and those who worship the beast. Those who receive the seal of God and those who receive the mark of the beast. When the third angel's message finishes in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12, the result is that the entire world has been ripened for salvation or perdition. Yep. And then you have the harvest scene in Revelation 14 and verse 14 and following. Let's go to the bottom of page 7. When the three angels finish proclaiming God's message, there will be only what? Two groups. On the one side are those who worship the beast in his image and receive his mark. On the other are those who worship God, keep his commandments and the faith of Jesus, and who have what? The seal. Thus the three angels' messages, what do they do? They polarize the world. Or they divide the world into two groups. And when the two groups are already separated, then probation will close. Because the harvest of the earth is fully ripe, the harvest has received the latter rain, and the grapes of the earth 
or the wicked are fully ripe, according to Revelation 14. Now let's go to the top of page 8. The harvest will take place when every person on earth has either accepted or rejected the messages. When probation closes, there will be only two groups. The first group to be reaped in the harvest of the earth, which represents the what? The righteous. Notice what we find in verses uh, 14 through verse 16. Then I looked. This is immediately after the third angel's message, folks. The three angel's messages have divided the world into two groups. And now comes the moment when the separation takes place. It says, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat, sat one like the Son of Man having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. What is the sickle used for? To harvest. So do you harvest, the, do you harvest things while they're still green? Well, they do some time to take to the supermarket. <laughs> but really, you're supposed to harvest, harvest when things are what? Ripe. Verse 15. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap. For the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he sat on the cloud, so he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. By the way, we, we usually refer this to the second coming of Christ, but the spirit of prophecy tells us that the harvest is the end of probationary time. So really, the, this harvest of the righteous it actually represents the moment when probation closes and they are secure on the Lord's, Lord's side. Now, let's go to the bullet points. The harvest of the earth and the grapes. The harvest accepted the three angels' message and the grapes rejected them. The harvest has the seal of God and the grapes have the mark of the beast. The harvest is within the spiritual city and the wicked are outside. See, before the second coming... We are spiritually in Jerusalem. That's a very important biblical principle that we can't really go into detail now. But we are citizens of the new Jerusalem, aren't we? Our citizenship is where? The Apostle Paul said our citizenship is in heaven. So before the second coming of Jesus, when you find the word Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem... It's not talking about being literally in the city of Jerusalem that descends from heaven after the millennium. It's talking about being spiritually in God's church. So the harvest is where? Inside the spiritual city of Jerusalem. Where are the wicked? They're outside in which city? Babylon. Now, wait a minute. If Babylon is spiritual, is Jerusalem literal? <laughs> Are you with me or not? Bab is Babylon worldwide? Is it a spiritual system, not the literal country in Iraq? Yes. So, the wine press where the Babylonians gather to destroy those who are in the city must be global, and those who are in the city must also be what? Global. Are you following me or not? If you want more on this, in the two-volume series that I did on the nuts and bolts of Bible prophecy, I prove beyond any shadow of a doubt that Jerusalem represents, in this period, before the close of probation, it represents Christ's church. Let's notice Revelation 14, verse 18. It says, And another angel came out from the altar, who had power over fire. And he cried, cried with a loud voice, now comes the second harvest, who had the sharp sickle saying, thrust in your sharp sickle and gather what? The clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So, are both groups ripe? Yes. Why is the harvest ripe? Because they accepted the three angels' messages through the power of the latter rain. Why are the grapes ripe? Because when the latter rain was poured out, the grapes or the wicked rejected the three angels' message. Are you following me or not? Amen. Now, so you have the harvest. Where are the grapes thrown when they're harvested? 
They're thrown in the wine press. Where is the wine press? Around literal Jerusalem? No. Because the wine press is where Babylon is cast. And Babylon is what? Global. So the wine press must be global. Babylon is spiritual. The wine press where the Babylonians are cast is spiritual. Those who are in the city are spiritual Israel. And they are within the spiritual city of Jerusalem. And the city is global for God's people. And the city is global also for the wicked. Notice verses 19 and 20. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it where? Into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Where is the winepress? Inside the city or outside the city? Outside the city. Now let's continue. It continues saying in verse 20, and the winepress was what? Trampled outside the city. So what happens with the grapes that are in the wine press? They are what? They're trampled. Who tramples them? Let's continue reading. And the wine press was trampled outside the city, and blood came out of the wine press. Oh, the grapes are symbolic. We're not talking about literal grapes. Do you know what a wine press is? A wine press, you know, the way they used to do it in biblical times. They would put all the grapes in this big, big place and people would get in barefoot and they would step on the grapes. You're never going to drink wine again. <laughs> and when they did that, they sang songs. In Italy, in some places, they still do this. And what would happen when they trampled the grapes? The, the grape juice would splatter on their clothing. And, the, and grape juice looks like what? Blood. It looks like blood. So it says here, and the wine press was trampled outside the city, and blood came out of the wine press. So we're not talking about literal grapes, we're talking about the grapes representing the wicked. And it says that the blood came out of the wine press up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. And so you say, now wait a minute. Trample, the wine press was trampled by the horses? Where'd the horses come from? For this, you have to go to Revelation 19. See, Revelation explains Revelation. Revelation 19, 11 to 16, tells us who is riding the horses and who is going to trample the winepress of the wicked who want to destroy God's city. What do you, uh, uh, God's people, why do you think that the, that the wicked are gathered outside the city? You think they've come out, they came out the, outside the city on vacation? They're outside the city because they want to look at the beautiful city from outside. No, what have they gathered around the city for? They've gathered around the city to destroy those who don't worship the beast or his image or receive his mark. Notice Revelation 19, 11 to 16. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a what? A white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written which no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. Oh, wait a minute. Is that his own blood or is it the blood of the wicked? Is he coming with his own blood? No, no. Let's continue reading. It says he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the word of God. And now we know who was riding the horses. And the armies in heaven. Who are the armies in heaven? The angels. The armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on what? On white horses. Now you might be saying, well, Pastor Barr, are you really connecting these verses as they should be connected? Do you remember that we read in Revelation chapter 14 about the wine press is outside the holy city? And horses trampled the wine press? Now notice what we find in verse 15. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. That with it he should strike what? The nations. So who is in the wine press? The nations. Which nations? The wicked nations. So it says, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, which is his word, by the way, that with it he should strike the nations, 
and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. And listen carefully. He himself does what? Treads on the horse with the armies of heaven. Treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And on his robe and his thigh, a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Are you catching the picture? Yep. So who comes to trample the wicked in the winepress that have surrounded the, uh, the spiritual city of Jerusalem to destroy those who are inside the city? Who comes? Jesus and the armies of heaven. By the way, who are the opponents of Jesus and the armies of heaven? I don't have this. Well, I do have it. The, notice Revelation 19, verses 19 and 20. If Jesus comes on a white horse with the ar armies of heaven, the angels, he's going to trample the winepress, which means he's going to strike the nations who surrounded the, the spiritual city, the church, to try and destroy the church. There must be somebody that Jesus is fighting against. Who? Revelation 19, verse 19. And I saw the beast. Did we find the beast in the third angel's message? Yeah. And the kings of the earth. I don't have time to show this now. But before the thousand years, the dragon is represented by the kings of the earth. In other words, the dragon is not mentioned directly here. The kings of the earth are represented by the dragon. You say, well, how do you know that, that the dragon represents kings before the thousand years? Well, it happens repeatedly. In, uh, for example, the dragon stood next to the woman to try and devour her child when the child was born. Yeah. Did Satan stand next to, to Mary to try and devour Jesus when he was born? No, how did Satan accomplish his purpose? By using a Roman king. You read about the church at Smyrna. It says, the devil is going to cast some of you into prison. So does the devil take people and cast them into prison? No, he used Diocletian during a period of 10 years of persecution to cast people into prison. Um, Pharaoh is called the great dragon in Ezekiel 29 and verse 3 because he is the instrument of Satan. So before the thousand years, the dragon represents the kings of the earth. And Ellen White says this in Testimonies to Ministers. So it says, I saw the beast. That's the same beast that ruled 42 months. And the kings of the earth and their armies gathered to them together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And now notice this. Then the beast was captured and with him the false prophet. Who is the false prophet? The beast from the earth. And the false prophet who works, now listen, who works signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. Does that connect with the third angel's message? Yep. Yes or no? Yep. Does it connect with Revelation 13? Yep. Absolutely. Yep. And then I want you to notice, so in Revelation chapter 14, you have the three angels' messages. They polarize the world into two groups, the harvest of the earth and the grapes of the earth. The harvest is spiritually in the city of Jerusalem. They're in God's faithful church, the, re the remnant. The Babylonians are outside globally in the wine press because they want to destroy those who are in the city. The separation has taken place. And when God's people appear to, at the point of being destroyed, Jesus comes riding a white horse with all of the armies of heaven to tread the wine press and deliver his people. Amen. And then do you know what the next scene is? Revelation 15 verses 2 through 4. What we did in Revelation 19 was just take you ahead. But now let's go back to what comes immediately after the harvest scene of Revelation 14. It says in Revelation 15 verses 2 through 4, And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who have what? The victory, the victory over whom? See, here it is. Over the beast, over his image, and over the number of his name, over his mark and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. They sing the song of Moses and the servant of God and the song of the Lamb. Is this the same song that the 144,000 sang in uh, chapter 14, verses 1 to 5? So in other words, there's going to be 244,000. No! This reaches the same climax that was reached in 14, 1 to 5. Are you with me? 
Continues saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. So once again, you reach the same climax. Now let's look at the summary, the link, link between Revelation 13, 14, and 15, 2 to 4. Revelation 13, 11 to 18, the land beast commands the world to worship the beast, his image, and to receive the mark. Revelation 14, 9 through 11, warns people not to worship the beast or his image or receive the mark. And Revelation 15, 2 through 4, speaks about the group that gained the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark. So in other words, Revelation 13 through chapter 15, verses 2 through 4, has a complete cycle of events from the time of Babylon till the time that God's people stand victorious on the sea of glass. Now how important are these messages? I'm going to read two statements in closing. The Adventist church has become distracted from what we're really supposed to do. The devil has led uh, the church in, to enter in a period of great strife. Yeah. Like he has led the United States into a period of great strife between the two political parties. Well, in the Adventist church, we also have two political parties. And we've been distracted by, from what we're supposed to be doing. It says there in early writings 258 and 259, I was shown three steps, the first, second, and third angel's messages. Said my accompanying angel, woe to him who shall move a block or stir a pin of these messages. The true understanding of these messages is of vital importance. The destiny of souls hangs upon the manner in which they are received. And then you have this beautiful statement. Nine testimonies, page 19. In a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. What is a watchman? That's a defensive, uh, a, a, a defensive function, isn't it? Yeah. The watchman defends. But the light bearer bears light and conquers. It's an offensive one. And so it says in a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. God has entrusted them with, with the last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the word of God. God has given them a work of the most solemn import. Import means importance. The proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's messages. And now notice this. There is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. This is the reason we exist. And if we're not doing this, we have no reason to exist. Amen. Let's not be just like all of the other churches. We are not like all of the other churches. We have a special message for this time. The proclamation of the three angels' message to the world. May the Lord bless us and help us to be those messengers that proclaim these wonderful messages.